Devices and International Women University. She is a distinguished academic academician with over 24 years of experience in teaching research and in the industry. She is considered as a pioneer in European Union legal studies in India. Under her leadership, she has been a part of numerous prestigious projects such as Erasmus Mundus program as well as that new Passage of India program. Ma'am, today will talk to us about the topic, Why must law teachers embrace technology? So, and all my colleagues from NLU Delhi and beyond NLU Delhi, the respected officers of Manupatra. <coughs> Why must law teachers embrace technology? Before uh, uh, dwelling on why the, and how and what is the way to engage, uh, I would like to ask you all certain questions. Uh, first of all, uh, let me know how many of you have used uh, technology in your teaching? In your teaching, I said. Okay, very few in this whole hall, very handful of people have used it. How many of you have created courses? Again, very, very small number, but there is a good number. Thank you. So, uh, uh, the uh, fundamental question that is asked is, uh, how exactly is the technology used? What is our model of uh, law teachers embracing technology or the use of technology in uh, legal pedagogy or uh, law learning? Uh, we have two important authors here. One is uh, uh, Daniel Benilla. Daniel Bonilla spoke about uh, algorithm of law teaching in the sense that how we can incorporate technology uh, in terms of adoption of the technology and uh, how this technology could be coming into the teaching of law, researching in law and also in the legal practice. So if we are looking at uh, teaching, we could look at a blended teaching. I mean we did that during the Post COVID-19 we did that, during COVID-19 we did completely online teaching in two modes, synchronous or asynchronous. Anybody is aware of that term? Synchronous, asynchronous? Yes, some of you are not aware. In uh, uh, synchronous you are directly doing, in asynchronous you may be putting up your video uh, where you have taught and then it goes online. So what we did was we used the smart boards, Zoom platform, we taught on the Zoom platform. Later on we shifted to Microsoft Teams because that was accommodating more numbers. Of course, later on we bought a paid Zoom platform, but in the beginning it was not available because even technology was evolving as COVID was progressing. So um, he defines this as sharing information between the student and the teacher or student and the taught and uh, student, teacher or teacher and the taught, then integrating computers and integrating cell phones. This was happening because I had students uh, talking when I asked a question and then I could hear the car horn. That means they were not in the house, they were somewhere outside. And then uh, we had to tell them the mannerisms that they cannot come in informal clothes, somewhere in t-shirts, we had a strict uniform in the college. So they took these liberties in online classes. So. Uh, other than that, what other way you have incorporated technology? How many of you have used anti-plagiarism software that turned it in? Quite a number, because before you publish, you would like to do that because journals will not accept or some other author may raise an objection. Uh, how many of you have used uh, videos in your classroom, your own video? Anybody has used embedded with you within the PowerPoint presentation? Embedded, embedded PowerPoint presentation, very few, one, two or three. And then uh, uh, use of software uh, in terms of uh, uh, increasing your productivity, which, which means that yeah, using a platform of discussion, using an interface, or you could also devise your class in such a way that even when you... Anybody has used chatbot? One person, two person, three persons. So uh, anybody has used it to evaluate student performance? Asking student to prepare a video and bringing the video as part of the uh, assessment. How many of you have done? Yes. So uh, these are the different ways. So whatever uh, Daniel Bonilla told in the United States context is also applicable to India because at least to those who are here in this hall, some of you are familiar with that. Now the next question that is asked is, uh, you know, uh, our uses of technology did get accelerated with the COVID-19, isn't it? All of us will agree because during COVID-19, 
we had no other choice but to depend on the technology and use online mode of teaching because we were concerned about our students. We were also concerned about keeping our institutes and educational system going. But there was resistance as well, isn't it? Did, did each one of you raise your hand? Did you experience resistance from your colleagues unwilling to go online? How many of you experienced it? Resistance from students? Plenty of you, see? So there was a resistance as well. Uh, 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 therefore, it also created certain anxiety, certain transition. Nevertheless, what is our learning? Do we need use of technology in teaching or not? How many of you say we need? How many of you say we don't need at all? One. We should not. How many of you say we should not? Only those who say that we don't need say we should not. That means there is a little gap there which needs to be addressed. That is exactly where sometimes our reluctance comes from our unawareness also, lack of awareness also. Uh, so the question here is, is there, a, is there, I mean I told you in the morning that final uh, purpose of legal education in terms of quality is to create justice education, right? It is to have a sense of fairness, accelerated, accentuated, and it is a means, as law is means to achieve justice, legal education is the means to achieve justice education. Without justice, there is no meaningfulness in legal education. If that were the theory, then how use of technology will serve justice to legal education is the next question. Theories like Duncan Kennedy have pointed out how legal education has reinforced the hierarchy. Who are the students in our classes? Now all of us who raised hands, including me. In our classes, the students who come are come from the, definitely from the well-to-do families. Otherwise, they can't afford these fees, including national law schools. They may raise a loan, but nobody gives them the loan, or even if they give the loan, there is a burden of repaying that loan. That means there's another earning member in the family. So sufficiently well-off people come to legal education. That means there is a large percent, uh, percentage of the society who are deprived of, they are in legal education, but they are deprived of legal education. So legal education of the quality that we are imparting or we are engaged with. Would you agree with that? Yes. Now you go to certain law schools, they teach in vernacular language. And if those law school products are coming to high court to practice by any chance or if they have an ambition of practicing in the high court, they definitely need a finishing school, the mentoring that we were talking, sir was talking about earlier. Definitely, right? That means, how many academies can we create in India in this way? How many mentor judges or how many mentor professors we will require? Can technology take that role? Can technology fill that gap? May not be substituting, sir. It may not be substituting, sir, but it can definitely absorb the knowledge, it can definitely transact the knowledge, which is otherwise purely not available to these students. That's one. Do these students have the access and capacity? They do have, because everybody has a handheld device. They may not have a toilet at home, but they have a handheld device. I'll give you the example. During COVID-19, the school where I'm involved as a trustee, uh, it, it has very high level schools, but it runs one school from where it started earlier for <coughs> the migrant children from Karnataka. That school has got fully Kannada medium uh, uh, syllabus. Now these students are coming from the family of one room hutment in shanty areas, in slums. So these children did not have mobile phones. So we had to contribute money and buy mobile phones for them. And through the mobile phone we were teaching them their lesson. And after we started teaching through the mobile phone, the children were a little calmer and the parents were thankful to us because these children otherwise felt left out from education. Whereas their other peers in English medium schools had the access to this education. So right to education if we are talking about. So technology does serve rights purpose and technology in another way, you know, if we were to look at traditional way of teaching law, traditional way of teaching law had its time. It had certain type of manpower. It had certain type of competencies as we spoke in the morning. But today is a time when there are so many law schools and there is Bar Council itself has confessed it in its uh, 2010 report, four tiers of law school. That means there are four gradations of quality in the law school. If you want those uh, institutes to improve their quality of education, then the answer is here in technology. 
That's what I argue. Therefore, I say that used rightly, with the right kind of expertise and with the right kind of uh, mission behind it, technology can disrupt the current approach to legal education. It has to disrupt. Because current approach to legal education has come of age. I will tell you, we should stop talking about the past glory of certain law schools and ranking etc. as the basis. If I were to introduce a new basis, I would say how accessible is that education, how affordable it is, how future oriented it is. So if you are talking about the future of legal education, as far as India is concerned, it should be a legal education which will be demographically reaching the dividend. It should be reaching that dividend to the huge young demography that we have, the number of law schools, how many more than 1,700 law schools. We are only talking about ranking when we talk about top 50 at the most. So aren't we excluding a whole population of law students themselves by that? Because legal education has a sanctity in the constitution, lawyer's profession is the only profession mentioned in the constitution. Therefore, there is a sanctity in terms of, uh, there is a priority that we should be assuming by the intervention of the government and the caretakers of the legal education that they use technology to use it as a means of democratizing legal education. Why democratizing? Because today legal education is reflecting the hegemony. The hegemony of the court-centric approach. Somebody said earlier, thinking like a lawyer. Why think like a lawyer in the court sense only? Think like a problem solver. Think like a good citizen. Think like a member of the society. Think as a justice person. I think thinking like a justice person and acting like a justice person is not necessarily restricted to the elite way or uh, restricted to the higher echelons of the society kind of way. So from that point of view, I would like to quote Gramsci that when a disruption happens, when a disruption, you know who is Gramsci? Gramsci was a young lawyer, a law student like some of you are here, who was imprisoned by Mussolini because he spoke about the idea of how mind control happens through the power. So, uh, he was in prison and the young man dies in the prison, but he wrote a book called Prison Book. His prison notes are considered as a sacrosanct notes if anyone is doing a critical analysis of power. So, Gramsci talks about how there is a need to uh, uh, look at, uh, you know, reconstruction through crisis. Because he, he was a victim of the, I mean, he succumbed to crisis. So, in the, in the prison he encountered some disease and he died, young death. But then the, the notes say every crisis is a, is a, is a, is a, an opportunity for reconstruction. We also have Schumpeter talking about creative destruction. So there is a kind of disruption and destruction, creative destruction occurring in this context because increased inequality in legal education. Yeah, we are talking about equality in so many classes. We talk about rule of law in so many classes. Have we ever done this whole such thing? So, if we are looking at legal education in terms of inferior legal education beyond handful of law schools, if we are looking at increased inequality in terms of skill building and quality in those products of that legal education, once upon a time these products were retired officers looking at a second innings. Once upon a time these were the officers who were looking at promotions from in their current job. Today it's not like the 65% of the demography. So, uh, that is why the disruption of the old ways, disruption of these ways to make way for restructuring, refashioning, the approach of pedagogy is what we need to look at to go ahead if we were to listen to Gramsci. And then uh, the next, uh, uh, you know, ideological foundation for me comes from Duncan Kennedy who said that legal education reinforces the hierarchy. So if we were to break this hierarchy, why should you break the hierarchy? You look at our criteria of admission. Look at our fee structure, you look at our uh, 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 student numbers, uh, I have done some analysis and I know that uh, people like uh, migrants as I told you or uh, minority or those who are from economically not so well off families, do they find place in our law schools? Uh, people are withdrawn from our law school because they couldn't afford the fee. So, after some time, or their family underwent some business loss, some earning member of the family died during COVID-19, 13 students lost their earning member, family member during COVID-19, we had to wave off their fee. So, these crises uh, show that uh, our law schools are not homogeneous as it was told earlier. And then, when we bring the professionals, they come to the class. I mean, 
not only the professionals, sometimes even we law teachers, the kind of background we also reflect, we come with that kind of vengeance on these young students by trying to talk as if uh, you don't know this, what you don't know, what you are is not assessed. That the psychoanalysis of teachers themselves and psychoanalysis of those who are in the role of mentoring uh, needs to happen first. Secondly, taking the mentee or the student in fairness to their socio-economic background, <coughs> their mental wellness background is only a fair treatment. And from all these point of view, sometimes moderating this kind of human interaction with at least 30%. That is what in America the law schools are pointed out. Now UGC also allows that. 30% of online integrated into the offline teaching could be good. It could be good for teachers also to be future ready. So what will the future look like? What will the future look like if teacher were to not to go for technology? I tell you if a teacher is not embracing technology, the teacher will become irrelevant because already, although the numbers are small, uh, Pre-COVID era itself, American Bar Association allowed online programs and it allowed online content, but not more than one, uh, one third of the law schools adopted it. But during COVID, everybody was forced to adopt and after COVID when it was seen, some of the universities came out with fully online master's program. They came out with fully online bar preparation programs. So because of this, the, in one way their revenue was hit, but during COVID-19 they didn't have that revenue at all. So this model gave them another opportunity because one who used to come was the one who could afford to travel to US, live in US. So now what is happening, large number of people from across the world are accessing through the technology and they are qualifying to the bar or they, they are doing the pre-bar qualifying exam. Some of them are doing the JD and today I am uh, launched its uh, two-year online program because it is not just Indians, it is from all over the world. Many Chinese want Indian education. <coughs> You know, it is no less of a country in terms of demography and young demography. So these are new opportunities for Indian education. There are many in the world who want to know Indian uh, what is happening in Indian law because Indian judges are held as role models in the Commonwealth. I don't know how many of you are aware. In SEC online, they have data which shows that our judgments are referred by Commonwealth countries. So with this in the background, if a law teacher doesn't embrace technology, there is a danger of them becoming outdated. There is a danger of them not serving the interest of justice. There is a danger of them not reaching those who really deserve to be reached. Because finally we are teachers, our meaningfulness is in reaching the maximum and in enabling through knowledge. So we empower ourselves through the technology uh, uh, for, uh, by serving the democracy. Because democracy is about that equality, right? It is about equality of access, equality of opportunity. So the disruption gives opportunity. Disruption through the use of the technology gives opportunity who are otherwise deprived of that opportunity. See the beauty of this whole disruption. So in the light of this, uh, we argue that uh, law teachers have to embrace technology, there is no other way. You need not become an expert and first you have to remove from your mind, the two ladies here who raise their hand, remove that technophobia. And uh, remove, the minute you remove your technophobia, the fear, your mind opens and technology is not difficult. It is like getting into the pool. You can either swim or you can even straddle through the pool, right? But the healing experience that you have, relaxation you have is great. Similarly, you get into technology, start adopting it little by little. I tell you, in 1990s when one of the theorists wrote that death of a law school, he said, death of lawyering, he said, end of lawyering. When he said end of lawyering, everybody pounced on him. Same ABA pounced on him. But later on, and he said that future communication between teacher and students will be by email. They didn't like these statements. But that's the reality. Today, how do we communicate to our students? By email, by WhatsApp. Do we communicate only that they come and queue up in front of dean's office? No, those days are gone. So, and during COVID-19 they couldn't also. So this is how uh, there is a need. Now the next question I have for you is uh, uh, that to be the better defenders of constitution, our students need to have technology. That doesn't mean technology can be 100% replacement of a teacher. That doesn't mean that uh, learning law through technology uh, will make you uh, believe that the teacher who is tech savvy only will be remaining in the fray or student who is tech savvy only will be remaining in the fray. There are areas where technology uh, needs to be uh, substituted as well as strengthened. 
uh, in terms of student competencies, what are these three areas for future law school? Number one, social intelligence. You contextualize the law school, look around where that law school is situated. So I'll tell you one beautiful experiment. That's why I said we should stop thinking about number one, number two law schools. Northeast India, recently, Shillong Law School's panel, I was there. You'll be surprised to know, just a six-month-old law school, this leader was earlier dean in IIT's, uh, IIT Khadakpur's uh, IP school's uh, law school. And the way in which he has conceived that law degree, with the data analytics, with the design thinking, because this is what we have to do in 21st century, designing the society, designing our thinking, having that social intelligence to understand the problem. Because too much of company of machine may also deprive us of our empirical faculties. So design thinking is very important and the most important area where computer cannot replace us, AI cannot replace us, what is that? Creativity. Finally, the creativity in AI, although generative AI is there, it also has a limitation. So the human creativity is something. So how do we enable our law students? How many of them have a uh, curriculum with art and culture? Earlier somebody was asking in terms of creativity. So how do you teach creativity? Creativity is not teach, uh, taught. Creativity is something that is to be stimulated. It is to be inspired. So as a teacher, these are the areas, uh, social intelligence, creativity, then there is a uh, very important third area and what is that ability to negotiate. Machine doesn't negotiate. It doesn't uh, penetrate deep into the interpersonal uh, metacognitive spaces. So that's where uh, we need to empower our students. So uh, from that point of view, if we were to enable our teacher for future, the most important approach will be 21st century skills. We have a lab in our law school which we developed through a Greek uh, university because of the European grant, competitive grant that we won. So what are those 21st century skills? Now those skills are identified as an amalgam of skills which have been identified by OECD, WHO and then uh, uh, SDG context. Now these skills are enabling you not to become the servants of the machine but to guide the machine, to master the machine and not to lose the human interface into the humane parts of our interaction. So from that point of view, the skills are mainly digital quotient skills and the soft skills that Sir was talking about, earlier speakers were talking about the emotional quotient skills. And then we have skills such as collaboration, creativity, uh, media literacy, literacy in terms of critical thinking about this and critical thinking and collaborative problem solving. We have developed a model of 500 hours we have integrated it into our first year law curriculum for undergraduates in the research curriculum for postgraduates and PhD. So through this, we want to uh, address that skill gap which is there. So our first mission was to train the teachers. Now we are going to teach uh, our students who will be the future teachers. So this is a very important aspect. Therefore, for that, how did we do that? We did it as a MOOC. It's a massive online course where uh, major portion was by Symbiosis, second portion was done by Banastali Vidya, which translated it into Hindi. They were education people, we were only legal education. We, uh, I mean, enhanced our outreach. And then uh, uh, one Chinese, two Chinese universities have looked at authentic learning tasks by using technology. And another uh, two Cambodian universities have looked at authentic assessment of these skills. So the, all these are available on a platform. Now the platform is not released because our project is just getting over. After that it will be released and it will be open to whole world. So this MOOC platform of 21st century skills is our humble attempt to integrate in a global way to prepare our teachers for tomorrow. So I told you the philosophy there is use of technology, becoming familiar with technology, using platforms, using it as a mode of discussion because there are so many tasks there that teacher has to do. So much of flipped classroom concept is coming in there and the most important lifelong learning. The learner will learn at their own pace and then there is adaptation. Now, you, some of you may ask why I should be familiar with the technology, especially in the legal field. I would say that there is a, 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 a AI tool called Lex Machina, which is there from Lex, uh, Lexis Nexus. How many of you are aware of it? So what does Lex Machina do? How much of data does it gather? How much of trends does it project? Millions of cases. So 
Similarly, we have uh, judge, uh, judge analytics, right? Justice analytics from uh, Manupatra, which is looking at what kind of interaction between which judge, in which theme, and in which case has yielded what kind of result. So, pre litigation analysis for the lawyers and for the judges will be very useful here. So, our whole burden of uh, backlog can be prevented from repeating with the, using this. Secondly, the whole backlog issue, already the CJI is looking at artificial intelligence engagement, artificial intelligence tools. We could engage our students only if we, they know this technology. And we could engage them in that technology, in the interface of knowledge and technology, in giving them that capacity to use the technology. Only if we are tech savvy, unless we understand how will we transfer that knowledge or skill or act as the <coughs> intermediary in the knowledge. Because today our role is not to uh, do the pedagogy, it is andragogy, because we are facilitators. We are no more uh, uh, traditional, uh, I told you, knowledge bank. We are now what, I didn't tell that earlier, it was panel discussion. Now we are, from knowledge bank, we have become the facilitators. So they come with the idea and we nudge them into some kind of a coherent whole. So from this point of view, Secondly, big data is very useful, even the judges, and for example, if a judge has to give a judgment, morning, uh, who was one of the judges was telling me about some IP case. If the judge were to give that case, so much of practical, operational context of that case is not known to the judge. And they would depend on their limited reading without knowing the nuances. You ask the same question to chat GPT, but then you push it through other AI tools, you will get a better data, other uh, search tools, search engines are available, you will get a better data. So, we have moved past that. Therefore, there is a need to ready your students for 21st century. That's why you should be uh, for tomorrow and for the current reality. Third, today's law product is not just suited for court alone, to assist judges alone or to argue a case alone. The, uh, they are also into problem prevention. They are into projecting clientele needs. Uh, in the light of huge foreign investment flowing to India. Today I was reading about reading, uh, Japan is going to invest and uh, huge, huge money in, as retail investors and uh, Canada is already investing. So if that is the environment, how are we readying the lawyers to work in a global environment? Only technology as a platform of interaction is the solution. And between you and students, also technology is going to be the platform of interaction and discussion. <laughs> so those students who can't afford, I'll tell you a case. Coursera. Coursera is the one which we integrated into our assessment system during the COVID-19. Students were more than happy at every level. For example, when they uh, when they first uh, attended the course, thereafter when they got the certificate, because sometimes the course duration is so big that they may not get the certificate. So we had to keep their learning log and based on that we devised our internal assessment in those respective courses. I was inspired to do this because I had one student who was excellent in drafting international law moot problems and he was only in second year and he used to draft the moot problem of the subject which was for the fourth year. So one day I called him and asked because I sent this problem to two experts in New Zealand, Australia and UK and all of them said flawless and they okayed it and mind you some of them were barristers. So I was thinking how this child has this uh, genius of uh, genius of a capability and I don't believe there is any mumbo jumbo or God's grace or something. There must be some hard work. So I called him and I asked him, you know what he told? He is the son of a postmaster who barely has a salary which could even, which can't even dream of visiting symbiosis. So what this child did, he got the admission to symbiosis in the first merit list. The mother tore the certificate and she said, if you go, we'll have to starve to death. So the child had to postpone his uh, dream. So in that year, he told me, day and night he sat, he went through all the possible law courses which are available on Coursera. He would not take the certificate because it needed money. You have to pay, then only certificate is yielded. So in that process, some 200 courses, he told me he had studied day and night and he had mastered the vocabulary of law, different ways of thinking. Now this I'm talking about 2017. And today he is in a very lead uh, project uh, management team, which involves multidisciplinary team. Uh, earlier somebody was telling about it, which involves uh, leadership, which involves uh, transactions leading to millions of dollars. Now, self-learned student. He is a brilliant student, 
So an average student also can come to that capability if normal learning is supplemented with that. Therefore, we need to be very creative if we want to have our product to be coming up to that kind of a readiness for future, future readiness. That's why I would say that when we are talking about outcome-based learning, outcome-based learning is a very scientific process. National Board of Accreditation mandated it. International accreditation bodies mandated it for management education, then technical education. Legal education has no whimper of that. I run those online classes for outcome-based education. If we were to align that with legal education, in legal education we don't even know the kind of competencies we require. See, for example, earlier we said uh, about competencies. The competencies, Berkeley competencies have business skills also. They have managerial skills also, leadership skills also, and communication skills also. So we first need to map these competencies and they have to be put into our entrance examination and then they have to be coming into our training process and then coming out in the form of students' persona development which may result in placement, which may result in other professional goals. So that is where I feel that we teachers will have to be embracing technology. Now, how have we been as of now? As of now, we are talking about law of technology. Some of you will tell me here, how many of you are IT teachers? Yeah. Uh, how many of you are uh, uh, teaching cyber defamation as a variety of cyber crime? And then uh, uh, software, how many of you are trained into software? I am asking from the law school or from the FDP program side as full time law teachers, very few. Uh, IT law, how many of you are teaching IT law in the law school? You are teaching. Uh, then uh, cyber crime. You are teaching. So, law of technology you teach. How many of us teach te law, technology of law? I am asking in terms of mainstream law schools as a full time law faculty, technology of law. Because that syllabus only is not there in the bar council list as a mandatory subject. So, first step we have to do is that it has to be a mandatory subject. Some of uh, we, it was optional. See, we had a computer lab, lab was there, students would go and sit. What to do with the lab was not told. So I developed courses. Now my courses are little outdated compared to present. So e-lawyering. Is there any course on e-lawyering? That is what happened during COVID-19 and many lawyers shied away. Some of them had to starve also. Then bar council gathered money to feed them. So this also happened because you, the danger of you becoming outdated if the students are not taught. Okay, next is. Uh, in your uh, technology law course, whatever course you have, it is called IT for law or some course, do we have anything on law practice management? No. Do we have anything on documentation, e-documentation, e-contracts, maybe as a little, I mean I teach it as a little part in drafting. And then software related to case management, code management, no. How many of you use at least that e-justice uh, national grid? for researching or familiarizing students when you're teaching theoretical subjects. <laughs> Thankfully, four or five hands went up. Um, uh, metadata, cloud data, cloud computing in relation to legal practice. And then uh, dark web, anybody has heard of dark web? You have heard of, yeah. Have you discussed it with the students? Yeah. Mobile application in relation <coughs> to legal profession. And then access to justice through the e-filing, in some cases at least, IPO is fully e-filing. Uh, ethical, uh, uh, therefore, we all have an ethical responsibility as teachers to be competent, to meet the needs of the student and to orient the student. We can even think about experiential learning. Right now, how do we do experiential learning in the simulation context? We can use e-platforms for simulation as well. We can, uh, experiential learning can be by integration of internships as well. E-internships, how many have done online internships uh, or have uh, overseen students who are doing online internships? It's possible, right? It's because law firms wanted the work to be outsourced. They couldn't have their juniors coming to office. They had extra work. They couldn't recruit also. Now, re regarding legal technology, if at all you have a legal technology course in your college called IT for Law, who is teaching it? In how many colleges librarian is teaching it? Yeah, see this is the <coughs> librarian is teaching it. And then how many credits is the course? Uh, you may not have credit system. Is it at least one tenth of the credit, total credit? Not really. It is just uh, an attendance audit course usually. And then uh, what kind of skill is uh, uh, 
specified there in terms of outcome based education, what Dr. Baj said. Nothing. I don't think in graduate attribute, in the law degree, anybody says technologically competent. You go to foreign university websites and look at their graduate attributes. After spotting the law, identifying the law, capacity to apply the law, they write technology. So we don't have that as a skill. And then, uh, uh, is there any law school which has a specialization or LLM? Let alone the undergraduate course, which is not there. Therefore, specialization is the last thing. We started the DMT specialization. I wanted to start it because some of my old students came for a conclave and I saw their performance and I asked certain questions and I thought that time has come and these girls can come and act as teachers. Then I read in the whole world only Queen Mary University has TMT, LLM. So we were front runners in that. So sometimes you have to spot these needs as teachers and you have to bring it to your students. Then, if at all we were to go forward, earlier Dr. Bajpai mentioned about uh, uh, legit quest. If we were to go forward, will we at least have a subscription model for our law school and for ourselves uh, and integrate into the course the existing tools, for example, Manu Patra's, uh, I told you, Justice Analytics, to begin with, or Legit Quest. How do we incorporate into our curriculum? How do we use our computer lab? I raise these questions and leave it with you. If you have any questions you can ask, I hope you are uh, convinced that it is necessary for our own competence and to maintain quality assurance in the legal education and to see that the byproducts of our, our education are future ready. I have much more data. I have done the latest uh, analysis on the basis of certain questions. Last point I would like to mention from your own development point of view. All of you want Scopus publication, right? Very few. How many of you have published in Scopus? Last thing in the law crowd because we don't have much journals there. But you know that any journal which has interfaces technology has, or science has highest chance of publication. Now when you publish in any of the scope of journals, they will look for a chart, they will look for a hypothesis, they will look for a technology element. What are the most pressing technology issues as of now? Artificial intelligence is one issue. Other day, I was trying to use Statbot and I was trying to use uh, AO tools, AI tools, etc. And I raised the problem. There was a Scopus uh, refereed conference coming up in Bering. That was about cultural heritage and museum. Can you imagine how I can link it with my legal dimension? So I wanted to check if e-museum concept is there. And I wanted to see can e-museum be taught? Can e-museum be legal pedagogical tool? It can be. Why not? If Supreme Court museum is attached to online, when you are teaching introduction to law, legal system course, you can put that because it draws the history. Or, you creating an e-museum in corporate law, Shantakumar Sir's institute, GNLU has, an e -muse has a museum on international law. If I were to do a virtual museum on that, how will I do that? As a pedagogic tool or educational tool. The other point I tried was e mock court or e mock trial, which we did during COVID-19, our students did that. So why not now incorporate it as a best practice, bring those students, video it, put it as part of your pedagogical tool, give it as a flip classroom exercise. Can we think of those things? <coughs> so this is how we integrate technology into learning in a small way, but I feel for the faculty to use it in a very comprehensive way, we need an FDP uh, project, we need a bar council sanction as far as technology, uh, technology in law is brought into the curriculum as a mandatory course because time has come and also to look at some of these content which I told you. How many of you have a website which can be seen on a mobile phone fully without disruption? Which is that law school? Your own personal law. Yeah, you have made it, you are tech savvy. Anybody else? So today's student, yeah, Kalpesh has. Today's student needs that. Today's youth wants that. They are Gen Z. Therefore, it is, it, these are all very important things to keep our learners with us. So you are, I am seeing it tomorrow where students will be tech savvy and they will be independent and they will be using this AI under their command for better performance. And you may be in addition to this not 9 to 5 job, maybe 9 to 2 job and rest of it will be working home because such is the uh, for, uh, print we are creating, carbon footprint we are creating. So 4 days a week has become a rule already. So we need to disrupt all our thought pattern otherwise as Stuart Hall, one of the great authors I like in culture and communication, he talks about how same economics, same
same social sociology, same culture, which existed then, cannot exist now. So we need to shift our thought pattern and reconceive the whole future in the light of where we are now and therefore technology becomes that hastening process in terms of our mindset change and enabling us and empowering us as Manupatra rightly pointed out. So these are some of the thoughts I wanted to share. If you have any question, you are welcome. Thank you very much.